literature that allows for preferences on bones, and uh, which is able to generate a downward sloping bone specific demand function. And third, our paper is related, related with a very recent paper by Ricardo Reis that identifies a different channels through which uh, macroprudential policies can uh, leave a fiscal footprint in the economy. What we do in this paper is to develop a simple two country dynamic general equilibrium model in a monetary union with public and private borrowers that face a downward sloping bond specific demand. In our model, the bond market consists uh, of four kinds of bonds, uh, lenders, uh, sorry, lenders uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the country has access to public and private uh, and also to national and foreign bonds. And we introduce a country bias in the bond market that summarize imperfect financial integration. We allow also, we allow for a risk premium that arises as an external effect and that creates an additional weight uh, between domestic and foreign uh, uh, bond uh, interest rates. Uh, we introduce different rules and we also, in addition to the rules, we al also allow for discretionary policies or different shocks on macro, fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, our uh, research uh, can be considered a kind of pre-normative analysis uh, with different findings. First, we find that discretionary macro potential policy in one country produces substantial cross-border effects in financial assets, real activity, and the fiscal footprint. Uh, results of asymmetric macropotential shock that affects uh, both countries can be replicated. We also find that can be replicated up to uh, the effect on private debt by a monetary surprise. And it means that a simultaneous discretionary expansionary monetary policy by the central bank can neutralize the three gaps that arise after a macropotential policy shock in output, in inflation, and in taxes. And it can do that without killing the effect on private debt. However, when the reduction of inflation becomes an objective itself, coordination between macroprudential and fiscal discretionary policies can improve the outcomes by improving production without killing the, infl the, the, the inflation uh, effect or imposing a cost in terms of higher taxes in the short run. In terms of design of policy rules, we find that a combination of tight macroprudential and loose monetary policy affects positively the output fiscal multipliers but minimizes the impact of technology shocks on GDP. A tight macroprudential rules not only helps fiscal policy to achieve the target of larger output, but also monetary policy to affect inflation. However, after a productivity shock, a tight macroprudential rule diminishes the impact on GDP and reinforces the negative impact on inflation. Okay, next I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to summarize the model. This is a two country model, let's call country A. Let's call it Spain because in the calibration is going to be calibrated to Spain and country B is Germany. Both trade consumption and bonds in a monetary union. Financial markets are characterized by homogeneous lenders that have bonds in utility function. That is, uh, we allow for preferences over private and public national and foreign bonds. Uh, this is a way to, to, to capture imperfect financial market integration in the monetary union, union due to uh, perceived differences in safety or liquidity or due to cultural reasons. Uh, of course, borrowers in each country are allowed to borrow from both national and foreign lenders as well. The total debt over GDP ratio affect uh, affects the domestic and foreign bond preferences and then generates a time varying risk premium. The good market is quite a standard. There is only one uh, uh, production factor, which is labor and which is higher in a competitive labor market. Uh, there is price stickness, uh, calvo fashion. Uh, we also allow, as we said before, for different rules in macro, uh, macro prudential, fiscal and monetary policy. I will uh, go, uh, come back uh, with that later. So here you can find the utility function regarding uh, patient households, which are, are becoming a lender in the, lenders in the model. As you can see, there are uh, different bonds in the utility function, okay? So these parameters here, 
it stands for, for, for uh, the preferences for the, the different type of, of bonds. As you can see, the preferences for domestic bonds, both private and public bonds, take these forms that this form that is uh, the, the preferences on this book on, on domestic bonds are going to depend on an index that take into account the total private debt in the foreign country as compared to total private debt in Spain. Uh, so when total private debt in Germany increases as respect to Spain, then preferences for domestic bonds for Spanish bond increases. So this is a way to, 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 uh, to introduce the risk premium. Okay, all agents in the model are unaware of the effect their decisions have on this total debt, including macroprudential policy. So this is, in that sense, we talk about an external effect. So from the first order of condition, we obtain, uh, among other, these four equations that uh, introduce no arbitrage condition among different assets. As you can see here, there are different interest rates uh, for different bonds. This RT here stands for uh, the reference interest rate set by the central bank, which we assume is the same as the safe asset, which is the German government bond. Okay, the interest rate uh, is related with the amount of bonds held, and also is related with this uh, index here, which is uh, uh, we relates uh, in turn with the risk premium. Okay, more particularly, differences in interest rate depend on three factors. First, the amount of bonds held by households. Thus, there is a downward slope in demand for bonds. Second, on the risk premium, and also there is a term, which is the terms of trade, which affects the demand of uh, uh, foreign bonds uh, as regards uh, domestic bonds, okay? So the definition of the risk premium uh, is the one that it takes into account how this index affects the, the difference in, in the interest rate of government Spanish bonds with respect to German government bonds, okay? This, it takes this form that you can see here. Okay, as regards uh, inpatient households in the economy, just let me to emphasize this collateral constraint, that is the ability that uh, borrowers have uh, to, uh, to take debt and to, and to, issue, and to issue bonds, uh, private bonds in the economy, is going to depend on uh, the capacity uh, to collateralize, uh, to extract collateral from the value of houses, which in turn depends on the loan-to-value. This loan-to-value is going to be one of the instruments used by the uh, macroprudential authority in, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in the economy. Uh, also, in the budget, if, you, if we look at the budget constraint, there is this variable here, which is the average tax rate by pay by, by by borrowers, there is also a tax, an average tax rate paid by lenders in, in, in their budget constraint. Okay, this, this average tax rate is the, is the, can be obtained by, the, by dividing the total tax rates paid by borrowers over uh, by the, 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 the labor income, okay? Total tax rates in turn depends on a flat rate, on a flat rate and depends on an exempt labor income. So the tax scheme in this economy is progressive and this flat rate is controlled by the fiscal authority. Okay, let's, let me skip the aggregation. Uh, regarding the balance of payment, just to, to notice that the trade balance here depends on the variation of the variation of the different assets, of the time variation of the different assets in the economy, okay? Okay, here uh, you have the different rules in the economy. This is the trade of rules uh, set by the central bank. Uh, on aggregate, uh, on the aggregate union inflation. Okay, this is the policy parameter, the relevant policy parameter uh, for our purposes. Okay, this is the fiscal rule on the on the flat rate. Okay, there are two 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 fiscal uh, policy uh, parameters here. The first one controls for the gap between the deviation of the government debt over uh, to output. Uh, with respect to an objective, okay, the second one controls for the speed of the adjustment. And the macroprudential rule uh, takes this form. This is the loan to value controlled by the macroprudential authority and moves according to deviation of prices of houses with respect to, to a target. 
Okay. As I said before, the model is calibrated for Spain, which is the representative country of the periphery of the European Union, and, and Germany, which uh, represents the core of the European Union. The most striking uh, thing here in the calibration is to, to give values to these parameters, which are uh, related with preferences for bonds in the utility function. Okay. In this regards, we, we solve a system of equation to target uh, different interest rates in the uh, monetary union and to target different ratios of debt holdings over total debt. Okay, uh, the first experiment we are going to the first experiment we're going to the, uh, to explain is is, is is the one in which uh, uh, in which uh, there is a uh, a discretionary macroprudential policy, a, uh, 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 a macroprudential surprise, okay? And we are going to study the effects on financial and, 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 and fiscal outcomes, okay? So in the first plot, you can see how the reaction, uh, what's the reaction of different bonds held by different agents. Uh, you can see here that macroprudential policy uh, gets the target of uh, decreasing private uh, debt in the economy. Uh, here you see the differ differences, sorry, differences in interest rates. So there is a reduction in the Spanish re risk premium because uh, lower, lower private debt and lower total debt in the economy. Okay, so the dynamics of real variables, the impact of the margin on the marginal tax rate in the two economies, the blue economy is Spain, the red economy is, is Germany. Uh, and to sum up the results regarding this experiment, uh, we can say that after a macroprudential policy in Spain, there is a change in the Spanish lenders' portfolio of assets from bonds to houses. There is also a, a diversion of Spanish bond holdings from national to foreign investors. Um, lower inflation rates and a weaker level of, of activity move government debt up, uh, and the increase in government debt to GDP ratio is even higher. So the fiscal authority reacts by rising the marginal tax according to the fiscal rule, okay? Uh, because weaker Spanish demand, German exports falls, and so does aggregate output. The rise in public debt to GDP compels German government to lift the tax rate, and thus an asymmetric macroprudential intervention that takes place only in Spain creates a non-trivial positive footprint in the whole monetary union. Okay, in the second experiment, we look at the effect, sorry. So in this second experiment, we look at the effect that uh, a reduction, uh, a surprise uh, in, in government spending in, in the shape of a reduction in government spending equivalent to one percentage point GDP, uh, what, what effects it has on, 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 on the two economies, okay? So again, you find the, the different reaction of bonds in the bond market, in, in real variables, interest rates, and, 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 and also marginal tax. Uh, here you can see red line, remember, is, is, is Germany. Uh, this shock takes place only in Spain. So you can see that the, the spillover effects are very small, okay? And, and to sum up the effects, to sum up the, 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 the main results of these experiments, you, uh, we can say that there is a negative effect on labor income following the reduction in, in Spanish government spending, and that induces a cut in borrowers' consumption and housing. The lower stock of houses affects negatively the borrowers' capacity to take debt and issue bonds. So there is a supply uh, shortcut of private bonds in Spain. This supply effect explains the lower amount of private debt held by both domestic and foreign investors. German lenders then uh, are constrained by lower supply of bonds in Spain and reshuffle their portfolio to buy more German private bonds. And so they speed up borrowers' indebtedness, indebtedness in Germany and increase consumption, uh, sorry, borrowers' consumption in Germany. So what we detect is that borrower's consumption reacts in a quite different way in Spain and Germany. It falls in Spain and it increases a lot in Germany, okay? The different behavior in inflation uh, due to different demand uh, uh, effect in the two countries improves the Spanish competitiveness. Spanish exports hike while German exports fall. 
The spillover effect on Germany on aggregate is weak, although it hides a change in the composition of German aggregate demand with more weight to, for consumption and less for the external sector, okay? In the next experiment, in the first column, we shock the economy with a macroprudential policy, okay? It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an, 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 an unexpected macroprudential policy of uh, a reduction in the loan to value in the two economies, okay? This is a symmetric shock. They are symmetric shocks now, okay? In the middle economy, we shock the economy, uh, we shock the, 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 the two economies with an increase in the interest rate by the central bank. And in the right column, we shock the economy with a, a negative government spending shock in the two economies, in Germany and in Spain, okay? The size of the shock is such that the effect, the negative effect on impact on GDP in all the cases is the same, okay? In the Spanish, in the, in the Spanish economy, okay? So what we see after this experiment is, is that the effect of asymmetric macroprudential intervention in the monetary union including the fiscal footprint, can be replicated up to the effect on private debt by means of a positive shock on the interest rate by the European Central Bank. And this provides an argument for coordination between macroprudential and monetary intervention. In other words, a European coordinating macroprudential monetary intervention allows for financial, sorry, for financial stabilization but neutralizes the fiscal footprint in the European countries and unwanted effects on the output and inflation. Okay, <clears throat> so in the in the in the final experiment uh, here in this in this first plot, we shock the economy with a government spending and look at the effect on GDP, depending on how tight or loose are macroprudential and Taylor rules. In the second plot, we shock the economy with a loan to value and reduction and look at the impact effect on private debt as a function of the fiscal and the Taylor rule. And in the last plot here, we shock the economy with a positive, uh, with an increase in the interest rate and look at, at the impact on inflation regarding uh, how tight or loose are the fiscal and macroprudential rules, okay? In all the cases, we compare the results with, uh, with the, 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 the with the case of a productivity shock as well, okay? And our main conclusions are the following. A negative government spending shock affects positively houses, housing prices. And so <clears throat> when macro, macro potential policy is tight, private debt is more negatively affected and borrower consumption falls by more after acting the macro, after the action of macro potential policy, the macro potential rule. Thus, a time macroprudential rule increases the fiscal multiplier. Moreover, a time macroprudential rule also helps to a monetary surprise to achieve a higher impact on inflation. However, after a productivity shock, a time macroprudential rule diminishes the positive impact of productivity on GDP and reinforces the negative impact on inflation. Okay, the takeaway messages are the following two. A discretionary macroprudential intervention alters the evolution of public debt and can impose a fiscal cost, not only in the country that implements it, but in other countries in the European Union. Also, a tight macroprudential rule increases the effectiveness of fiscal and monetary shocks. This pre-normative analysis would have to lead to a more comprehensive normative analysis in which different shocks and different weights uh, uh, on different targets exist. And this is next in our research agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, we'll move right along to the next paper. So the second paper is risk-taking banking crises and macroprudential monetary policy uh, with May Hakamata. And I will uh, give you a five minute and one minute warning in the chat. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for including my uh, project to this great sessions. Can you everyone see the screen? Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, I am Maiha Kamara. I'm from the UC Santa Cruz. Uh, today I will present my project of the risk-taking banking crisis and macroprudential monetary policy. So, 
So uh, before and after the financial crisis, we observed several important uh, behavior of the bank and then the outcome on the financial panic. First observation is low credit spreads increased bank risk taking. Uh, during the boom moment, low interest rate and saving grad induces the market in uh, spread to be shrunk. As a result, bank was seeking for the, taking the risk on the asset side. Second point is this risk taking increases the probability of the financial panic or market freeze to uh, occur. And this financial panic uh, disrupted the credit supply in the market and this transferred the real side of the economy as a severe recessions. And thirdly, uh, the monetary policy non neutrality on the credit spread literature talks about uh, monetary policy interest control can affect the credit spread into the market. So by observing these facts, my question in the research project is if there is an endogenous risk taking of the bank and it can affect on the probability of the financial panic to occur, how should the central bank adjust the policy rule during the boom to prevent this materialization of the bank plan? And in order to tackle these questions, I constructed a simple new Keynesian model with bank and have several important features. The first is endogenous bank risk taking, particularly uh, my model bank chooses a risk by selecting borrowers monitoring, especially in the low spread environment, bank will reduce the monitoring intensity, which is characterized in higher risk choice on the asset side. This is a story uh, consistent with the story of the search for yield. And the second part is endogenous bank plan in dynamic models. So higher risk taking during the boom will induce the more loan to be default. As a result, probability of the land to be increased during the boom. And my model is New Keynesian model and it has a banking sector. So lending channel of the monetary policy tells us higher interest rate will reduce the credit supply from the bank. As a result, the spread in the market to be higher. So basically properly chosen counter cyclical monetary policy can reduce the risk taking motivation of the bank during the boom and can reduce the vulnerability to the bank land at the end. So uh, my contribution of this project against the literature first is that a positive part of the model. I basically constructed the model which endogenized the effect of the bank risk choice during the boom on the bank land. And the second part is more important by using this model I can characterize at the, and evaluate the market potential law of the monetary policy. Uh, I will describe the model part directly from here. And then since my model is a new Keynesian type DSG model, I have a lot of agents in my model. And this presentation, I will focus on the banks uh, mainly, but I will describe briefly here the other agents. So the household holds bank deposit or directly finance firms and supply labor to the intermediate firms, bank supply to the uh, loans to the intermediate firms by raising deposits, and they choose the monitoring intensity. And there are intermediate firm capital goods producers, leaders firms uh, as a standard new Keynesian framework, and the central bank decide nominal interest rate following the Terra rule. And the exogenous state in my model is a capital quality shock, endogenous state to be a capital and a bank networks. So I directly, uh, before explaining that the bank optimization problem, I want to describe that how the intermediation to be held. The capital is either intermediated by banks or directly held by household. ST is a capital or loan security and STV is a, a portion that held by bank and STH is a held by household. And when the capital is held by household, it entails a management cost, which is described as quadratic functions. And this influences the return on the capital. So return on the capital, RKT, is standard notations of the capital gain, uh, sorry, income gain plus capital gain. So this DT is a rental rate and QT is a price of capital and CT is a capital quality shock. Uh, so that is the income gain part and the capital gain part. And this management cost in terms for the household uh, actually changes the return on the capital for the household. LTH is the return on capital for the household holding and the denominator has this management cost part. So basically when the capital is held by household, 
because of this management cost, return on capital to be lowered. This feature is important. When I talked about that the bank land equilibrium and the fire sale liquidation price later on the, my, pre, my project uh, presentation. So then bank, they raised the funds from the household deposit at late LTD and they lent to intermediate goods firm at RKT. And they choose a monitoring intensity which takes the value between zero to one. The bank balance sheet is described in the equation one, which is asset side is the loan security or capital SDB and the liability side is deposit DT and net worth NT. And banks face the borrowing constraint, which is asset divided by net worth, which is a leverage, must be smaller than or equal to the certain value. This is in, uh, existing in my model to uh, introduce the dynamics of the credit spread. Intermediate goods firm project has a stochastic return, which is with probability MT minus one, it's success and then it, or EU that's RKT. However, with probability one minus T minus, minus MT minus one, it fails and doesn't yield any return. So we can observe monitoring increases the probability of the return, but entails a quadratic cost. So it needs to be determined in the optimal equations. So I want to further discuss about the bank risk choice part. Uh, net worth of the bank accumulated via retained earnings. So uh, with probability or fraction MT minus one, the project succeeds so that the return on the capital to be paid to the bank. So the bank will pay the deposit rate and the monitoring cost too. However, when the project fail uh, with probability one minus MT minus one or fractions, uh, bank doesn't receive the return on capital and also they don't pay the deposit rate. So this part is important because it describes that the bank does not fully internalize the default cost. So here is a more hazard problem that kicks in. Monitoring is not observed so that bank is choosing monitoring intensity just as to maximize their own value function instead of their household value functions. And as a result of this future optimal condition for the monitoring to be equation four, which is monitoring intensity empty to be determined so as to equalize marginal cost and marginal benefit by changing the one unit of the monitoring intensity. So the right hand side of the equation is basically about the credit spread, discounted credit spread. So we can see that monitoring intensity will be determined according to the credit spread dynamics. Particularly because of the lending channel, uh, lower spreads uh, environment induces the lower monitoring intensity. This is consistent with the story of the search for you. In the boom moment, bank will reduces the monitoring intensity, which is increasing the risk of the asset side. So that is the one important feature of my model, risk taking during the boom. And the second important part of my model is the bank land future. So here I want to describe the definition of the bank land and later I want to connect then how it's collected with that risk taken during the boom. At the beginning of period T, depositor decides whether to roll over or, uh, or land. And definition of the insolvency and sunspot uh, run is here. So banking sector to be insolvent if the asset value to be smaller than outstanding liability. Even if the banks are solvent, means that asset value to be greater than or equal to the outstanding liability, the sunspot run can occur if asset liquidation value to be smaller than outstanding liability. So here the difference between insolvency and sunspot run is asset liquidation value characterize the fire sale price. Remember in the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about the intermediation difference between the banks and household when the bank run equilibrium to, uh, to occur, the capital is intermediated only by household. So the high fire sale occur from the banks to the household. As a result, this liquidation price of the LKT and QT, QT start to be very low. So that even in a normal price, uh, bank is solvent. However, with this liquidation value, bank can be uh, insolvent. That is the definition of the bank run here. So by using this bank land definitions, I want to characterize the bank land probability. So the, the 
time t probability to the bank run at t plus one is denoted as PTR, which is probability of that the banking sector to be a uh, long lesion, which is asset liquidation value to be smaller than outstanding liability, and multiplied of the probability of the line equilibrium materialize. Here I am multiplying this copper because uh, in the bank line equilibrium emerges, there are two equilibrium exists, exist, which is a bank line equilibrium and normal equilibrium. So by following the literature of the Gatfrakio Taki Prespino, I exhaustively chosen this value and multiplied to uh, complete the probability of the land definitions. So this probability of the land lesion, I can map to that the size of the shock. So basically, I am using this CT plus one. This CT plus one is a capital quality shock. Uh, so using this threshold value is CT plus one R, which is the threshold capital called the shock value below which a long equilibrium to exist. So if the economy in the next period has the bigger negative shock uh, than the threshold value, uh, economy can be in the long region. So in order to further characterize this threshold value, we can equalize this definition of the bank land lesions and then solve for our KT plus one star, we can mathematically define that this uh, threshold value of the uh, capital called the shock. Intuitively, important part is constant risk economy, which doesn't have endogenous risk staking, boom shock, which is a, cop a cap positive capital quality shock of core, then return on the capital to be increased, so the bank balance sheet status will be good. As a result, it is less unlikely to occur in the bank land in the next period, means the stressful value of the capital quality shock to be lower. And as a result, probability of the land to be lower, this is uh, the standard channel against the positive capital quality shock. Beside that channel, because my model has endogenous risk taken during the boom, I have the additional channel, which is given here, which is in the boom moment, credit supply increases. As a result, the credit spread in the market to be decreased. Because of the search for it behavior, monitoring intends to be decreases, and the result, asset liquidation value today to be decreases because asset liquidation value is basically a function uh, of the summation, discounted summation of the future income of the return on capital, which is a function of the monitoring intensity. And if this asset liquidation value to be lower today, the stress for the value to be uh, higher because it is more likely to the go, go to the land lesions. So as a result, probability of the land to be higher. So this is important connection between the uh, pre-crisis booms risk taking on the bank and that effect on the probability of the land. So based on this model future, I will do the simulation exercise here. So calibration, I use this, uh, a standard uh, values mainly from the literature. And then I'm, I'm using that the monitoring cost coefficient here uh, from the senior loan officer's opinion survey from the pet board the moment. And then here, the same first exercise, which is given the positive capital quality shock to the economy. As a result of the positive capital quality shock, so this red line is the endogenous monitoring economy, which is the baseline of my model, and constant monitoring economy is the blue line. So positive capital quality shock will increase the bank net worth. As a result, the credit spread in the market to be reduced. And endogenous monitoring economy characterizes the monitoring intensity to be decreases. And as we saw in the prior page, if the monitoring intensity be decreases, asset liquidation value to be decreases, which increases the probability of the land here. So we here we see that the difference of the endogenous monitoring economy and constant monitoring economy for the probability of the land. So that is the boom exercises. And next I want to use, I want to describe that the boom and the bank land exercises. Uh, so here. Uh, gray line is a data and the blue line is a constant monitoring economy and red line is the endogenous monitoring economy, which is the baseline of my model. And then here I'm given two types of the shock. First is the similar to the prior page, positive capital quality shock in that uh, year of the 2004 to describe that the boom economy and also 2008 Q4, which is around the Lehman Brothers went bankruptcy. I am adding the two shock. First is the minimum size of the shock to push the economy to the land lesions, which is a negative capital quality shock. 
And then also I am adding the sunspot run uh, shock, which is actually let the net worth of the bank to be zero. So important takeaway here is remember because of the uh, pre-crisis uh, moment has a decreases more than intensity, probability of the land to be higher. So as a result, what is capitalized here, minimum size of the shock to reach the land region to be smaller for the endogenous monitoring economy compared to the constant monitoring economy. This means because of the pre-crisis risk taken, economy becomes more vulnerable against the bank plan. And then finally, I want to describe that, okay, so with this framework, how we can evaluate the market position low of the monetary policy. So the lending channel of the monetary policy show that credit spread is a function of the interest rate and that credit spread uh, in my model can affect the monitoring intensity. So basically uh, strongly counter cyclical interest rate, which is a stronger lean against the wind, uh, the Taylor rule uh, can unwind that risk taking behavior during the boom. So this one has that count additional criticality by introducing the monitoring intensity and this is the same exercise, only changing the Taylor rule part. So this blue line in the Taylor rule uh, with the monitoring intensity concern and red line is the same as to the prior page, they are using just standard Taylor rule. Only the Taylor rule with the monitoring intensity concern can uh, prevent the bank run to materialize because of this, again, that a stronger uh, counter cyclicality can unwind the risk taking of behavior during the boom and that can reduce the probability of the line at the end. So conclusions, uh, I endogenize the bank risk taking on the bank run in the policy part of the model. And using this uh, framework, I could describe that the strengths in the counter secret monetary policy can play a macro prudential role. Uh, that is, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Mai. Uh, so next we have paper three. Uh, macro prudential policy interactions in a sectoral DSG model with staggered interest rates. All right, um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. I just set this up. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, great. Okay, um, so thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Mark Hinderschweiger from the Bank of England. Um, this is joint work with um, Kunal Kainar, Tolga Otzen, and um, Tom Stratton. Just like a brief disclaimer, so this presentation represents the views of the authors and not necessarily those of the Bank of England. All right, um, so let me dive right in. So we develop a two-sector DSG model. Um, which consists of mortgage and corporate lending with a detailed banking sector um, along the lines of Clerk et al. Um, 2015, which is essentially for, for those who have read it, the um, ECB's three layers of default model or, or 3D model um, with um, kind of banks, um, companies, and, and households, um, which can go bankrupt in, in, in their model. Um, so the motivation um, essentially for this for this paper is that we wanted to develop a workhorse model that could allow policymakers to assess the interactions of uh, macrodential um, policy tools. So, for example, sectoral capital requirements, um, the countercyclical capital buffer, or loan to value um, limits, which we've already heard of, uh, of before. Um, so, in this model, which is kind of one of the main um, innovations over Clerk et al., is that we kind of have a particular focus on, on interest rates as transmission um, channels. Um, so basically, we um, uh, kind of assume that interest rates are sticky, so they take some time to adjust. Um, so there's some frictions here, and we kind of found that, or we kind of established that empirically in, in the paper, but but we, or I don't, I don't discuss that here in, in great detail. Um, so some of the frictions that we have in the model are, as I mentioned, interest rate stickiness, um, essentially modeled uh, a la Calvo, um, so in parallel to price stickiness, just here for interest rates. Um, you have limited liability, bankruptcy costs, and a penalty um, cost function for deviations from regulatory capital requirements. Um, we estimate the model using Bayesian methods um, with UK data over the last um, 20 years. Okay. 
So in terms of the main findings, um, just to highlight three of them. So first, what we do find is that um, if a policymaker coordinates kind of the different microdental tools, um, that actually has a bigger welfare improvement effect than if they just look at every tool in, in isolation, which is maybe not, not a big surprise, um, but it's I, th I think it's still a nice um, um, kind of result that comes out of this model. Um, second, so if we take kind of this optimal, kind of the optimal policy calibration that we found in this first step, um, and kind of create a counterfactual exercise um, where we apply this to kind of the last 20 years and then create a counterfactual to see what would have happened if those tools had been in place at this calibration. Um, then we find that actually the policies would have improved um, kind of GDP consumption welfare. Um, so that all these values would have been a, a bit higher, but um, they wouldn't have prevented the, the global financial um, crisis. So you still get like a drop um, during the time, um, um, yes. Um, and last, um, we do find that kind of this introduction of staggered interest rates or sticky interest rates actually has an important effect uh, on the transmission of microdental tools that work, especially through interest rates. And, and I'm going to show like some of the results that we uh, that, that, that we have there. But essentially, the, the bottom line here would be yeah, it's quite important to include those in the model if you um, if you want to um, kind of kind of have have the effect uh, or assess the effect appropriately that microdental tools um, have on the economy. Okay, um, so maybe let me skip um, the literature, um, but we're drawing on like a, a, a bunch of different strands um, here. Um, and let's go right to interest rate um, stickiness. Um, so interest rate stickiness can, can be defined in different ways, um, but essentially here, what I'm kind of highlighting is um, the fact that uh, kind of interest rate or, or mortgage terms, for example, they have like a fixed initial rate uh, or a fixed permanent rate for, um, for many contracts. So in the US, for example, you have a fixed, 30 year um, product, which is kind of the standard um, product in the UK. Um, usually only like the first couple of years are fixed and then it converts to a floating rate. Um, but what you can see nicely in the case of the UK here is that um, once the policy rate changes, which is here the, the dashed black line, then depending on how long this initial fixed rate or fixed kind of period is, um, kind of the effective interest rate takes some time to adjust. So if you're not taking that into account in, in, in the model, um, then essentially you kind of miss some of the uh, dynamics of the adjustment that's, that's going on. And I'm just showing that here, um, you know, on the left for mortgage lending, on the right for corporate lending, just to give you like a little bit of, a, of some like idea what's, um, what's kind of happening. Okay, <clears throat> then in terms of the model, um, so as I said, it's based on the ECB's uh, three layers of default model. Um, so I don't want to go through all the, all the different elements here just to highlight uh, as usual, patient households, inpatient households, we have a banking sector that can give mortgage loans and corporate loans and, and all the other bits and pieces. Um, so if you want to refer back to that, maybe after the presentation, um, uh, then, then this, is, this is probably very helpful. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the estimation, so we have um, quarterly data um, in the UK for kind of 20 year period, roughly, um, for 10 key um, kind of variables, mostly um, interest rates and growth rates. We uh, fix um, hard to estimate parameters at either kind of conventional val values that you can find in the literature or steady state values um, that are consistent with, with UK data. And then we estimate the remaining parameters using Bayesian likelihood methods. So just to give you a very brief idea of what, um, what that kind of means. So here, I just show you two of these estimated parameters, which are kind of important, which is the stickiness parameters for mortgage and corporate lending. Um, so if you just look at the posterior um, results for the mode, and um, then you find like a stickiness parameter, which is kind of similar to the Calvo parameter for price stickiness of kind of 0 0.72 for mortgage lending and 0 0.5 for um, corporate lending. And here on the right, um, I just calculate roughly what that means um, kind of for how quickly um, rates adjust. So it's about three and a half quarters for mortgage lending and two quarters for, for corporate lending, which I, I guess, you know, is kind of consistent with the charts that I showed you early on. Okay, um, so then what do we do? So first um, we calculate um, kind of what optimal policy or optimal macroprudential policy would, would look like. Um, so to do that, we have to define um, kind of our objective function. Um, so we define uh, household welfare um, as mentioned here. So essentially it's a weighted average of the um, inpatient and patient household welfare weighted by the respective consumption shares. Um, and then kind of once we have this um, household um, 
kind of variable uh, that essentially what we do is we kind of try to optimize it based on the equation at the bottom, which uh, the first term is essentially just the expected um, value, which in our kind of cases was the steady state value. But then uh, we have kind of a negative effect of the volatility of welfare. Um, so the idea here is that um, um, depending on policymakers' preferences, which depends on omega, um, you kind of want to achieve some smoothing of kind of welfare. Um, okay, so in on this slide, on the following slide here, I um, kind of show what results we get if we just um, individually kind of optimize different different policies. And and I can't unfortunately go like through every single number here, but just to to highlight some some patterns. Um, so in terms of the um, LTV policy, if you assume like an omega of zero, so you don't put any any weight on on um, kind of volatility, then actually you get like a loosening. So the, the baseline value here is 86%, um, but like this optimal value would actually be uh, higher uh, or kind of lose at 89%. But you just get like a little bit of a welfare improvement, which is here in, in, in brackets. Um, if you do have, if you if you put some weight on volatility, which is on on the right here, then um, you you get like a value that's pretty close to the actual baseline value. So your your welfare improvement isn't isn't very large. Um, but then if you look at the other values, you actually do get quite a lot more um, kind of welfare improvement for for capital tools. Um, and um, so just like to to highlight two numbers. Um, so if you look at the at the zero column for for omega, omega equals zero, then kind of the best you can do is a, a welfare improvement of seven, roughly seven point five percent for a um, mortgage SCR. Um, that number drops to about four point three percent for um, like if you put some um, some value on on volatility as well. Um, so just like to keep like these two numbers, seven point five and four point three, in 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 your mind. Now the question, or more interesting question, now is okay. What happens if we kind of optimize all these kind of parameters uh, jointly? So we essentially do a grid search over the parameter space, and then we kind of see what values um, kind of maximize um, welfare. And we find this one here. So what happens here is that the LTV is actually still higher than in in the previous case, so it's even looser. Um, and capital tools are higher than in the baseline, but they are a bit looser compared to kind of the individual case. So essentially, if you can use all the different policies at the same time, they all do some of the heavy lifting and um, you can actually even like loosen some of them um, and um, you don't have to tighten um, some of them as, as strictly, which again is not a big surprise, but it's still nice to, to see that coming out of the model. Um, in terms of overall welfare improvement, you actually get in the case of zero, like when we get equal zero, 8% improvement. And in the case of, um, Omega equals 0 0.1, an improvement of 4.8%, which is both somewhat higher than in the individual case. Um, so essentially, the advice for policymakers would be, you know, if you want to like improve welfare um, to the highest possible amount, you should kind of definitely try to combine um, policies and look at them jointly rather than individually. Okay, <clears throat> now kind of as I said before, as a next step, what we do is we use these optimal values and we plug them essentially in and see kind of as a counterfactual exercise, what would have happened if these policies had been in place over the last kind of 20 years um, compared to the baseline case. Okay, so baseline here is in black and the counterfactual is uh, kind of the red dashed lines. And so if you look, for example, at the top left um, boxes, then you see that borrowing is actually higher both for households and businesses compared to um, kind of the baseline case, which is consistent with what I told you earlier that the LTV is actually a kind of higher in an optimal way, um, which essentially means like you get like a, a larger boom. And um, as a consequence, also like the household default rate is higher, which is in the middle here. Um, so the question is, why can you do that? Or why is that actually better? Um, well, the, the answer is like here on the right hand side, uh, we're bank in the box of bank default rate. So that's um, lower. Uh, given that you have put more capital in the system. Um, so essentially that allows you to go a bit um, looser on, on um, kind of borrowing. And because you do that, um, essentially it means, as I said, business borrowing is higher, which leads to higher investment, higher um, output, um, which means you have higher welfare for, for savers, um, a little bit also for borrowers, mainly because they can buy more houses. Um, so overall your total welfare is, is higher. Um, than it would have been um, in, in the baseline um, scenario. But you still get that drop um, during the financial crisis where output kind of drops quite considerably and then other variables as well, um, 
which is in a sense not not a surprise potentially um, given that the model doesn't have other policies which I which I kind of mention um, in, in in a bit. Okay, now uh, so the last exercise um, that I want to show you is um, kind of a little bit looking into kind of this interest rate um, stickiness, um, kind of the effects of interest rate stickiness. So here I compare four cases where uh, essentially I use um, high stickiness um, and low stickiness for both corporate and um, uh, kind of uh, household um, mortgages. And um, so kind of it clearly shows that there are some differences here, right? So if you focus on the top right side with household interest rates and business interest rates, um, so if um, the degree of stickiness is low, then actually interest rates uh, vary quite a lot. So it's a blue and the red line here where um, kind of they, they drop quite a bit and then relatively quickly also go back to the um, uh, kind of the equilibrium. And uh, if you have more sticky rates, you know, the black and the, the green line, then it takes a little bit longer, which again, is not a big surprise given that, that we've modeled it that way, but that has effects on the other variables in the model. So here I just show you, for example, at the bottom left aggregate output. Um, so in the case of, um, of um, more sticky interest rates, actually output drops by more. And um, the reason for that is that um, interest rates can't adjust as quickly. So some other variable has to pick up the slack, which in this case is, is output. So clearly, if you don't take into account the right degree of, of interest rate stickiness and how interest rates, how quickly they can adjust, um, clearly that uh, that matters a bit or quite a bit for, um, for the variables in the model. So policymakers should definitely um, take account um, of interest rate stickiness. Now, how does it matter for um, uh, macroprudential policies? Um, so here, I again compare um, kind of I, I compare two things. Actually, one is the um, high stickiness versus low stickiness, and then a um, sectoral capital requirement that's set at a low level and a high level. Um, so, if you first compare on the left chart um, the green and blue line versus the black and the red line, you kind of see that in the case of low sticky nets, which is like the, the green and the blue ones, um, here you get a, a sharp peak, but then the adjustment happens more quickly uh, versus in the case of the, the black and the red line where, where sticky nets is higher and the adjustment isn't as big at the beginning. So the peak is lower, but it takes like uh, a longer amount of time to go back to uh, kind of the, the equilibrium. Um, so, so clearly that Again, interest rate stickiness kind of matters for for um, for for the adjustment, um, but you can also see that actually the difference uh, between like if you now compare green versus blue and black versus red, kind of the difference is lower in the case of so the difference if you increase kind of capital requirements is lower in the case for high stickiness. So it has like also this kind of effect on macroprudential tools um, uh, that. Kind of you need to take into account um, and that kind of matters for um, for micro potential tools depending on how sticky interest rates are um, so this is here i showed you the case for corporate ser this last slide uh, with impulse response function is um, kind of showing you the results for housing ser so you get like quite similar um, results here that are qualitatively um, similar and of course you can do that for for different types of shocks so yeah i use like a positive bank capital shock but of course you know as a policymaker, you might be interested in other types of shocks as well. So you can do this in, in our model um, easily as well. Okay, um, then um, just coming to the conclusion. So I already went through all of that. And um, so maybe just let me add um, some of the limitations of this model. Um, so there's no monetary or fiscal policy in this model, which essentially is a kind of a feature that we inherit from kind of the original um, Clerk et al. Um, 2015 model. Um, but clearly, if you, if you want to answer a question about, you know, would this policy uh, or would policies have prevented the global financial crisis, right? Um, you most likely need monetary policy in there as well and fiscal policy as well, because they did quite a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, um, but you could then kind of Add on and say, okay, um, maybe the, the buildup was lower uh, or lower with uh, with micro potential policies and the drop was lower. Um, but yeah, that's definitely for, uh, for further research. And second and last, um, in terms of other next steps, um, you can also put in other micro potential policies in this model. Um, so, for example, instead of a loan to value policy, we already have a version with a loan to income policy. Um, so, you can kind of mix and match a little bit and see what, what effects uh, different um, policies um, would have. And um, one other thing we realized is that, is that um, kind of learning behavior seems quite important. So there are some papers out there that look at learning behavior around the zero lower bound of monetary policy, which has quite a substantial effect. Um, 
in terms of like the dynamics and we think something similar might be important here as well. Um, so effectively, that's kind of one of the next steps that we're considering to putting some adaptive learning behavior in this model as well. And um, with that, I'm at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mark. So we'll move on to the fourth paper, risk mitigating effects of being prompt and transparent. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have some difficulties starting my presentation. Uh, let me try again. Uh, yes, so host disable participant screen sharing. Um, not sure whether can someone enable that for me. Uh, I think I stopped sharing, but I'm not sure whether I should do anything else. Okay. Uh, let's see, is it working now? Uh, I cannot tell. It's, yeah, we can see it now. Okay, uh, great. So I'll try to maximize it. Um, Okay, it's not letting me apparently. Okay, anyway, uh, so I hope you can see the slides well. Uh, so it's a joint work with uh, Song Li uh, at the Federal Reserve Board, uh, just like I am, and uh, Lucy Lu at the IMF. And because we like our jobs and we like to keep them, and I have to provide a disclaimer that uh, the presentation only uh, reflects our own views. So, uh, uh, so what this um, paper is about. So you may be aware that policymakers have a dilemma. Um, so. Um, uh, the effects of uh, lawful long interest rates and risk taking by banks and corporate lending uh, is a big deal, and uh, a lot of uh, that risk taking is uh, cross border. Uh, but policymakers have pretty limited uh, tools, in particular macroprudential tools, uh, that target such uh, lending. And so, uh, you know, we uh, dug deep into literature to see uh, what we can uh, glean from there, and it turns out there is. Um, a big body of literature on the risk taking channel of monetary policy and corporate lending. Uh, you know, quite often it deals with credit risk and pricing of loans, uh, but not necessarily with quantities of risky loans being originated. And um, there is not much on uh, risk mitigation on this particular channel. So we came across only one paper by Altavia, Lucinia, Pedro, and Smet, uh, which looks at particular uh, the reduction of um, supervisory powers at the ECB. So, in a way, it's sort of uh, in the one study because it's just sort of one off. Uh, event, but uh, the advantage of that paper is that they have literally millions of loans that they can uh, look at. And um, uh, the second board of literature is uh, actually a supervisory one. So it deals with efficacy of micro and prudential tools in mitigating risk rate, uh, mitigating credit risk of lending. Uh, that literature completely ignores uh, the risk taking challenge monetary policy, so sort of deficient from up front. So we're trying to kind of combine these two bodies of literature in, in our paper. And we're going to look at efficacy of tools, both micro and uh, macro prudential, as well as private monitoring in curtailing originations of risky uh, US dollar denominated syndicated term loans in response to lower US um, uh, policy rates. So uh, uh, I'm sure that you don't really deal with syndication that much. So I have a little uh, introduction here. So syndication is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it's basically, um, uh, a loan made by uh, multiple uh, lenders to uh, one borrower uh, who is typically uh, a, a corporate. Uh, so we draw our data from Toys and Reuters uh, for a couple of uh, decades. Uh, then um, this uh, uh, market is uh, pretty large. Um, so originations of syndicated term loans are comparable to um, uh, issuance of uh, uh, US uh, dollar corporate bonds. Um, so magnets are not exactly the same, but uh, I think they're both in the, in the ballpark. Then uh, on the demand side in this market, you have uh, lots of low-rated uh, borrowers from uh, all around the world. And on the supply side, uh, you have uh, mostly uh, banks at the moment of loan originations, uh, but uh, these banks sell uh, stakes in those loans very quickly. You know, practically within a month, uh, the stakes uh, in aggregate go from something like 80% to just uh, 20 uh, so banks originate, but we quickly sell those loans to, um, uh, to non-banks. So if you can control what banks are doing in this market, that you pretty much can um, control the supply of, uh, you know, these risky loans to the secondary market. So one um, key feature of syndication helps us a lot with identification. I try to illustrate that with a short uh, diagram here. Um, so uh, we, know, we look at the loan to a given uh, uh, borrower, but then you have multiple banks that uh, lend to that borrower. 
and these banks come from you know different countries so they say different degrees of uh, uh, you know supervision regulation or, or monitoring so in, in a way you know because it's the same borrowers it's the same credit risk but you know you'll see that banks uh, may be taking different stakes uh, in that uh, loan depending how stringent the supervision that uh, they say okay uh, moving on so the next slide gives you a little uh, hint uh, at the uh, results. So in particular, you know, we try to sort of uh, explain here uh, or answer the question, does um, supervision regulation monitoring, so SRM, affect banks risk-taking differently when policy rates are low? And uh, we do that by the means of the four uh, box plots. Um, so they um, are constructed based on uh, deal scan data. This is where uh, syndication uh, data comes from. Then the borrower risk is measured by expected default frequencies that we borrow from Moody's Analytics. And then for the stringency of um, you know, supervision regulation monitoring, uh, we go to uh, you know, uh, BARF, Caprio, and uh, Levine surveys. And uh, in this uh, slide, we focus on one of those um, SRM measures, uh, which is from corrective power. So it's basically tells you how um, so to what extent supervisors are able to uh, intervene uh, quickly in a particular bank and uh, prevent the bank doing certain activities. Um, so uh, uh, Barf Capri and Levine summarized that particular power on a scale from zero to six, uh, where six is the highest power and zero is the lowest. And the uh, figure on the right then you know, shows you that uh, when uh, uh, rates are low and banks operate in um, an environment with a low prime corrective power, uh, it takes uh, much more uh, risk uh, than uh, uh, when rates are low and another bank, uh, similar bank operates in an environment with uh, uh, high protractive power. So this is uh, the uh, uh, two leftmost um, box plots on the chart. And then uh, you don't really see this kind of pattern when interest rates are high. So it doesn't really matter whether a bank operates in a uh, environment with low protractive power or high protractive power you know, they originate, uh, you know, very similar uh, loans. So then, you know, the question here is that, you know, is protective power special, you know, why it's particularly effective? Does it complement or substitute other uh, supervisory, regulatory and uh, monitoring measures? And that's what the paper is about. So um, now kind of moving to the uh, formal analysis. Um, here I present our uh, benchmark regression model, which was, which is sort of looks horrifically complicated, but uh, it's not. Um, so on the left, um, uh, the stake of uh, a particular bank and a syndicated loan to a particular borrower uh, at a given time t. On the right hand side, one of the key variables is R, which is a shadow fail funds rate, which we borrow from Wu and Sia. Uh, and then identification here uh, is uh, very similar to what I showed on an earlier slide. Um, so it's within syndicate variation in um, bank uh, stakes in a given loan. and. Uh, uh, within sort of syndicate duration and bank um, supervision, uh, regulation and monitoring measures. And, um, you know, we saturate uh, our model with, uh, you know, lots of uh, fixed effects and uh, we pay attention to um, a couple of interaction terms. So one of them is this uh, theta ER, uh, which is um, a parameter that captures three staking channel of uh, a monetary policy. And uh, we hypothesized that to be uh, negative for the channel to, uh, to exist. And then the second one is the uh, theta ESR um, coefficient. And that actually captures the uh, mitigating effect of supervision, regulatory, uh, or supervisory measures on the risk taking channel monetary policy. And uh, obviously, for this channel to be a mitigant, uh, it has to have a positive uh, coefficient. So this analysis is about intensive rather than extensive margin, right? Because we look at the uh, composition of uh, the syndicate, you know, when not studying decisions, why particular banks uh, actually re uh, originate um, uh, loans to given borrower. Uh, you know, we think this analysis can be uh, done on extensive margin as well, but uh, it requires a bit more um, uh, data than, than we have. And then uh, as I already mentioned that all the SRM measures come from uh, Barf, Caprio and Levine. So the service that we have end in 2014, and that explains why we cut our sample at uh, 2014 as well. Another big reason for uh, stopping there is that uh, that's the year when the ECB took over the supervision of the largest banks in Europe. And uh, because they provide the bulk of our uh, uh, sort of uh, lender data, um, 
and the ECB functions very differently from uh, the regional supervisors. So those banks, you know, had to cut the sample as well at 2014. Okay, so moving on to the uh, results. Um, so here, uh, I'm sort of showing you all the dirty laundry. Um, you know, you see that uh, uh, you know there are eight uh, columns in this table, and uh, they're based on two samples. Uh, so the first four, four columns are based on the global sample. So this is where you know we include everyone. And obviously, because we're talking about US, US dollar denominated loans, uh, the global sample is you know dominated by uh, US banks. And so as a robustness check and a sanity check, uh, we also estimate our uh, models on non-US sample, meaning that we exclude um, uh, US lenders. Um, so, you know, it kind of gives you multiple advantages. Uh, you know, now the sample is no longer dominated by US banks, then, you know, you can argue that uh, the sample, you know, is clear, more clear of any indigeneity concerns, so it provides you better notification. And, uh, uh, another good thing about this is that uh, in the United States, regulation and supervision were pretty stable, so you don't see much variation in SRM characteristics for U.S. banks. Whereas um, outside the United States, uh, you know, you see plenty of changes in those measures, so you're actually getting more variation and again strong identification because of that. Um, so here we're paying to um, two particular rows uh, of uh, coefficients. So in this um, Yellow oval, uh, you have the coefficients that identify every staking channel of US monetary policy. As you can see, it doesn't matter which column you pick up, you get the negative coefficient, which is consistent with our hypothesis. And uh, that coefficient is uh, uh, robust uh, uh, and statistically significant everywhere. And then in the pink oval, you have the uh, mitigating uh, uh, coefficients that um, pick on mitigating effects of, um, in this case, strong tractive power. Um, and, uh, you know, you get here a positive coefficient, again, no matter in which column, you get statistical significance and, uh, you know, it's robust. So, um, uh, you know, basically here, you know, we're just confirming our uh, guesses what, uh, you know, the picture should be. So you have a risk-taking shallow monetary policy, which is significantly mitigated by uh, uh, prone corrective power. Um, so uh, a little experiment here, you know, tells us that if we increase prompt range of power from the sample median to the maximum. So, you know, you go from something like three or four to six, you know, we can uh, significantly lower the potency of the risk-taking channel of monetary policy. Um, so this is sort of great news. So we don't have a full offset of risk-taking channel, but uh, at least a significant one. And then in the paper, we'll also look into specific features of prompt connective power that explain why it is effective. I'm not going to drag you through those, so I'm just going to mention you know, some of the things that came up. Um, so prompt active power uh, works uh, because of early intervention, meaning that supervisors can step in quickly and uh, preclude bank from doing and the desirable activities. Uh, then um, the way they sort of do this uh, uh, is by issuing cease and diseased orders. Uh, and then uh, another thing that um, seemed to be very important is the suspension of uh, capital distribution and uh, management compensation. So you kind of hit the management in, uh, in the pockets and uh, you hit the bank investors in their pockets as well. So moving to the uh, next slide, uh, uh, it summarizes uh, a variety of other results that we uh, have uh, in the paper. And uh, this is where we explore uh, other uh, SRM measures, not just prompt reactive power. In particular, we're exploring whether uh, there are complements and substitutes uh, and so on. Um, so one interesting thing that comes up here is that the macroprudential tools are not particularly effective here. Um, this sort of contrasts with uh, what you would expect, uh, you know, based on the current literature. Uh, so one of the reasons here is that uh, it turns out that um, uh, the capital regulation or macroprudential tools are sort of described in the uh, BARF and uh, other uh, others uh, survey and not necessarily correlated with actual bank capital ratios. So that might be one of the reasons why this particular channel is not working. Um, so I'm not going to go for the list. If you're interested, please check, uh, you know, the paper. And so um, uh, moving to uh, uh, conclusions. So we think that regulators may do without macroprudential tools that uh, target uh, leverage uh, corporate lending, uh, which certainly great news, for example, for US regulators uh, that used to have this tool, but uh, not anymore. Then um, we also conclude that uh, SRM measures may reduce financial stability risks uh, from leverage lending by curtailing um, originations of uh, risky loans in response to policy rates. 
So remember, I opened up the presentation by saying that banks are sort of gatekeepers in this market because they originate uh, risky loans and then sell them off uh, quickly. So if you control originations, you control the supply of risky loans to the secondary market. Um, then uh, uh, the other sort of things that come up in our uh, paper is that uh, because of the significant share of syndicated lending uh, is cross-border, there might be spillovers from you know, one uh, country to, uh, to another. And so in a way here, you might have you know, positive externalities from one uh, regulator being uh, you know, strict. That basically means that uh, banks in uh, that jurisdiction are going to originate uh, less risky loans, not only domestically, but also internationally, which then you know, will minimize any uh, risks, financial stability risks from uh, excessive leverage lending in another country. Um, so one uh, caveat to our analysis is that in response to more stringent um, SRM measures, a uh, shadow bank may grow to dominate loan originations. And in fact, uh, in the paper, we show that uh, um, we can you know, pick in the data already uh, some um, uh, leakages of uh, strict SRM um, in the sense that shadow banks pick up shares in uh, loan originations from uh, uh, more strictly regulated banks. And you know, mind you, our data is something like six years uh, stale. And so at this point, the importance of shadow uh, banks in the market has uh, definitely grown up. Um, as for caveats, uh, you know, I already mentioned that we're not looking at the extensive margin, but you know, we think that's sort of doable if we had better data. And then uh, the other thing that we don't study is the intensity of uh, usage of SRM measures. So you can imagine that uh, you know, supervisors may be reluctant to uh, uh, be strict uh, in certain uh, times. Uh, so, for example, think about the uh, in the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, maybe on purpose, supervisors might want to go uh, light on banks in order to stimulate uh, you know risky lending. Um, so, we have no control for this uh, intensity of usage of SRMs, uh, but uh, you know hopefully we can address that in some future research. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to the fifth paper, Optimal Macro Prudential Policy and Asset Price Bubbles. Okay. Hi, I hope you can hear me. So thanks a lot for um, uh, putting um, uh, the paper in the program. This is a uh, joint uh, work with uh, Nina Bijanovska and Lucina Gonska from uh, the IMF. So after the crisis, there has been uh, more or less a consensus that uh, we should lean against uh, financial imbalances. And uh, new tools uh, have been developed that uh, target credit roles, such as the silicon capital buffer, uh, loan-to-value regulation, or debt-to-income regulation. Uh, still, there is a debate whether these tools should take into consideration asset prices on top of credit when they are designed. And the debate more or less goes in the following direction. For example, Jordan co-authors have shown recently that asset price booms are only dangerous when they are, uh, they are accompanied by high credit growth. So if we are able to fix credit growth, then probably we shouldn't worry a lot about asset prices. And this is in line, essentially, with a very influential paper by Bernanke and Gertler that said that central banks should not lean against asset price bubbles. Though this was from monetary policy, and we talk about macroprudential. On the other hand, Recent work by Greenwood and Hawthors also says that the combination of rapid credit and asset price growth actually increases the probability of financial crisis. So what we do in this paper is to focus on overvaluations in the stock market. So we will have in mind the equity market and we will study the interplay with business credit. Now this interaction has, it has not received a lot of attention uh, after the crisis, because the crisis mainly centered in elevated housing prices and mortgage credit. And the previous episode of elevated equity markets, which was the dot-com bubble, had small real effects because it was not credit fueled. Now, if we look now at the data, the situation is very much different today. On the left, you have 
a chart with house prices and the residential mortgages, and on the right you have stock prices and firms uh, borrowing. Uh, as you can see, lately, stock uh, house prices have continued to increase, but the measure of over-indebtedness actually is subdued. So there's not much to go there as there was in the financial crisis that the two were moving very fast. The situation is much, much different when you look at non-financial uh, business credit and equity market. And this is exactly uh, what we want to understand. And we want to see whether policy should respond to equity overvaluations on top of over indebtedness. And if yes, then should it be more aggressive or more accommodative? What do revaluations do? And uh, we will use uh, a small open economic DSG model as, uh, 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 to study this question with two elements. First, we will have asset price values, and we will borrow the technology there from the AAR paper of Miao and Wang. And then we will have occasionally binding borrowing constraints, uh, as in the JPE paper of Bianchi and Mendoza. What are the key findings? We find that there is a non-monotonic effect of uh, asset overvaluations on optimal policy. So you should lean against credit growth more aggressively when there is a bubble and elevated credit. But on the other hand, you should lean against credit growth less aggressively when there is a bubble and moderate credit. What does this mean? You can have your typical, let's say, counter-cyclical capital buffer or loan to value regulation, and then you have to adjust it up and down depending uh, if there is a bubble, depending if credit is elevated or not. Now, the mechanism is actually very intuitive. Asset overvaluations relax borrowing constraints. They are good because they allow firms to borrow more and they alleviate the downturns. On the other hand, when you have hit a crisis or condition in a crisis, elevated bubbly prices deflate very, very fast. And this creates an amplification through the borrowing constraint, it amplifies the financial frictions and exacerbates the downturns. So these are the two opposing forces and it gives rise to the non-monotonic effect. Let me jump to the model. So there are three types of agents, households, firms and global financiers. And uh, households are the sole owners of firms that are traded in the stock market. Firms produce using capital and they purchase this in the capital market. And finally, the global financiers lend to firms in the debt market. This is the model. So let's see the households. Problem is very simple. They want to maximize uh, the expanded discount utility, and they have a very simple decision. They need to decide how much to consume out of the dividends that they get from the stock, their holdings in the stock market, and the capital gains, which is the difference in the prices. And the first order of optimality conditions will give us uh, how they price uh, how they price equities and the price of equity today is just the discounted uh, price of equity tomorrow plus the dividend. This is a very simple equation. So what firms are going to do? Fair, the representative firm is owned by the household, and as such, it will operate in the best interest of shareholders. So it will fall. It will choose. Uh, the level of capital and the level of debt in order to maximize current dividends, but also the expected value, uh, the expected future value of the firm. Current dividends are given by the return on capital plus the net borrowing, so you can extend some of that, minus the net capital expenditures. And importantly, firms are uh, borrowing constrained here, limited commitment property. This says that the new borrowing on the left-hand side can only, cannot exceed a fraction M of the value of the firm as going concern. And this is the important part, and which we borrow from beyond one. You don't collateralize only the liquidation value of the firm or the, fees, the, the value of the tangible assets. You collateralize the firm as a whole. The firm is the firm as a whole. Actually, this is something that we observe in reality very often in loan contracts for non-financials. And this is the work by your Germany and Man or Union and Man. So essentially, when debtors would like 
to foreclose the firm, they can take the whole firm, they can create the same story. They can take the whole firm, they can restructure it and send it back in the market. As such, they don't need to use the bubble component. The bubble component will be part of the value of the firm as going consent. It will relax the borrowing constraint and we actually create a virtue circle that it will, the self-fulfilling beliefs of a bubble will raise the value of the firm, will raise borrowing, will raise productivity. So after solving the optimization problem, we can actually compute what is the value of the firm as going concern. And it is the value of the physical assets, QT, KT, plus the collateral value of the bubble, which is the future value of the bubble, given that you confiscated the collateral value of the bubble, it is how you can relax collateral constraints in the future. And this creates the interesting equation at the bottom that says that the collateral value of the bubble is less or equal to the value, to the value of the bubble in the equity prices. And come back to that. Okay, having having uh, having uh, described the uh, unregulated competitive economy, we can go to see uh, how the social planners economy would look like. And here we follow the Ramsey approach. So, socially, a social planner will choose allocations and prices to maximize the household's utility and will respect the resource constraint of the economy. It will respect the borrowing constraint faced by firms, so it will not be able to get rid of the financial frictions. It is a constrained economy that we are studying. And also needs to have to take into consideration three additional constraints. The first one is the competitive pricing, how the price of capital is determining the competitive economy. This is the user implementability constraint, and there is nothing else than the first order condition of firms with respect to capital. This is typical in the Bianchi Mendoza. The other two constraints are what the bubble introduces and says that the planner will also take into consideration how the bubble evolves over time, how the bubble accumulates, how the bubble is priced in equity prices. This is a rational bubble. But on top of that, the planner will need to take into consideration how much of this bubble that accumulates over time she can pledge as collateral to relax the financial friction. And this is important because the current balance of the constraint will matter for that. So there are these three additional constraints, these three constraints that the plan is consideration, they are to come to the bubble. What is the difference between the planner and the competitive economy? The presence of a pecuniary externality. So private firms ignore how their borrowing decisions affect equity prices and uh, they neglect this. In particular, there is, uh, there is the physical price of capital and there is also the bubble valuation. So the planner will take into consideration both. But let's see how it does that. Here I have an economy that the collateral, that the borrowing constraint is not applying today. So we can focus on the macroprudential rule, leaning against the leaning, leaning against imbalances because we don't have a crisis today. And let's forget the bubble for a moment. This is the typical Bianchi Mendoza vote. And I have the owner equation for bonds. Essentially, it is equal the marginal utility today to the expected marginal utility tomorrow. This is the competitive economy, but there is an additional term that the planner takes into consideration. And this term is, it, 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 it is due to the pecuniary externality. What does this term say? It shows how borrowing at T affects prices at T plus one. And what is the mechanism behind that? More borrowing at T needs to be repaid at T plus one. Then I will have to cut down consumption if my collateral constraint binds. Lower consumption means a higher marginal utility and this puts pressure on asset prices. If asset prices go down, this means that my collateral constraint gets more binding, which means I can borrow even less, which means I can to cut more consumption. And this is the amplification mechanism that the plan takes into consideration. And actually, it would like to put a tax on debt for that. What is happening in the presence of the bubble? We have two additional manifestations of pecuniary externality. The first one is in red, the other one is in green. The, uh, the, the term in red captures how more borrowing at T reduces consumption when the constraint buys at T plus one. And it is exactly the same mechanism I showed you for the fundamental externality from the fundamental price of capital, but it operates through a bubble. So the bubble amplifies the typical externality that we have. Now, the other part, which is the green one, it is novel for the bubble, it is specific for the bubble, and it captures how a binding constraint 
directly affects the portion of the bubble that can be placed as collateral. Not the whole bubble can be placed as collateral. Only a part of it can be placed as collateral, and the planner understands this. And this is the lower part of the, of the bubble, which you don't have uh, for the fundamental price. So how do you do? How do you compare, as I told you in the beginning, macroprudential policy uh, in the presence of a bubble and the presence of a bubble? You would like to, to, you'd like to address these externalities by putting a tax on borrow, a macroprudential tax on borrow. This is from Yang Mendoza. So we take the difference of this macroprudential tax on borrowing when there is a bubble and when there is no bubble. And you can disentangle this effect into, into two effects. The first one, which we call extensive margin, captures how the fundamental pecuniary externality changes. And essentially, the bubble can relax future collateral constraints, so the fundamental pecuniary externality will be smaller with the bubble. But on top of that, you have an intensive margin because of the presence of the bubble, asset prices will deflate faster, and you will have a positive effect on the tax. So to determine, essentially, uh, how the, in which direction the tax goes and to study this monotonicity, we will calibrate our model and solve it using global solution methods to capture these nonlinearities. The gas regulation is like Bianchi Mendoza, and the bubble will be calibrated according to George Sular and Taylor. So let me show you the main the, the chart that shows the main result of the paper. On the x-axis, you have the level on current indebtedness, so the current level of debt. On the y-axis, you have the macroprudential tax. And we have two, uh, two taxes, the one in the presence of a bubble, which is the solid line, and the one without the bubble, which is the Bianchi Mendoza, uh, the dotted line. As you can see, for moderate levels of debtedness today, you want to impose a lower macroprudential tax when the bubble is present. The extensive margin dominates in this region. But as you increase the level of debt, the, int the intensive margin becomes higher. You want to you you want to put a higher tax in the presence of a bubble, and this is exactly the non-monotonicity that we were describing before. So bubbles are good to relax collateral constraints, but when they're they're, they're accompanied by high debt levels, we should uh, we should actually lean against them. Now, another way to see this is the other diagram, which on the x-axis, I have the bubble as the, as the percentage of the fundamental price, and on the y-axis, I have a normalized tax uh, at the, at the non-bubble equilibrium at 100, and then we see how it changes for three levels of debt. As you can see, as the bubble increases, you will want to have a higher macroprudential policy to lean more against credit growth for higher level of debt, but you will want to ease the macroprudential tax for lower levels of debt. And um, just, uh, just to mention that uh, simulating the economy, we can see that actually this macroprudential policy that uh, we suggest can produce sizable welfare gains of 0.4% in terms of consumption, uh, consumption variation, compensating consumption variation. And the macroprudential policy is not, it's not that high. On average, it's 1.7% and the maximum 5.3. This means that on average, you just do need to increase the cost of debt by 1.7% to get these welfare, welfare gains. So to conclude, macroprudential policy should respond to asset price overvaluations, and the response depends non-monotonically on credit conditions. When credit is elevated, macroprudential policy should be more aggressive than the absence of asset price bubbles, and uh, when credit is moderate, macroprudential policy should be less aggressive than in the absence of asset price bubbles. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our final paper, macroprudential policies and Brexit. Okay, is it okay? Am, am I sharing the screen? Can you see me? Yes. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for attending the, the session. 
And uh, please, if you have any comment after the session uh, or question, feel free to email me and, and I will be happy to answer and that will be much appreciated. So this paper is about how macroprudential policies are going to change after Brexit in terms of uh, welfare and also optimal policy making both for the UK and for the European Union. So it's a very hot topic because uh, these things have been discussed in the last days. So as you all know, uh, on June uh, 23rd, 2016, the UK had a referendum and decided to leave the EU, what is called Brexit. So the economic and con institutional consequences of these decisions are still to come and of course are surrounded by great uncertainty. So right now, these are challenging times to policy makers because they have to negotiate the terms and conditions of Brexit. And also they face the challenge of implementing these conditions afterwards. So after the referendum was made and Brexit, Brexit was going to come, there have been uh, many studies that were looking at economic consequences of Brexit. Some of studies uh, conclude that Brexit will reduce economic growth, but the scale is, uh, is, is not uh, certain. So it varies uh, from study to study. But uh, most of the studies have been uh, focusing on trade issues and the financial market perspective has been neglected. So one of the issues that remains open to debate is how Brexit is going to affect macroprudential regulation and financial stability. So this is the, the uh, gap in the literature I aim at filling. So the cost of Brexit could become larger than studies suggest, or maybe not, due to the lack of cooperation in macroprudential supervision. So how is the setting of macroprudential policy in the UK? So macroprudential policy is set by the Financial Policy Committee at the Bank of England. So the, the Bank of England takes the responsibility of monitoring risk and implementing macroprudential policies. But as part of the EU, um, the UK was under the umbrella of the European, system, uh, uh, European Systemic Risk Board, who was in charge who is in charge of supervising macroprudential policies uh, in the EU. But after Brexit, of course, uh, the UK is no longer in the EU, so, so it's not going to be uh, either under the supervision of the European Systemic Risk Board. So this should have consequences. Brexit then brings a new macroprudential institutional framework. The European Systemic Risk Board is going to lose its power over the UK. So according to the Treasury on the exit day, the UK will no longer be subject to the jurisdiction of the European Systemic Risk Board. So then it comes my research question. So what are the welfare and optimal policy consequences both for the UK and for the EU of this change in the macroprudential uh, framework after Brexit. And I abstract from other economic consequences or trade issues or political consequences of Brexit. I just focus on macroprudential policies. So what is the model I have in mind in order to answer this research question? So it's a two country model so that one country is the UK and the other country is the EU. It's a microfunded DSC model with housing in which we have two types of agents in its country, savers and borrowers. Borrowers face a collateral constraint, which is more or less tight depending on the loan to value ratio. I'm going to allow for cross country heterogeneity in housing markets so that I can pick up key features in both economies. Monetary policy is national and this is not going to change. And macroprudential policy is going to be also national, but I'm going to allow for two regimes. And it's going to be this um, approximated as, an, um, as, a, as a tailor type rule for the LTV. 
So as I said, we have uh, savers and borrowers in its economy. So let me just describe the, the, the problem in the UK because the one in the EU is analogous. So savers in the UK, they, they just maximize a utility function on consumption, housing and labor, leisure, subject to the budget constraint. And then the borrowers. So the borrowers face a similar problem, but they are different from the savers in the sense that they are more impatient and need to collateralize their debt. And I'm going to allow for borrowers to uh, borrow either at a variable rate or at a fixed rate so that uh, a proportion of borrowers will borrow, borrow at a variable rate and the rest at a fixed rate. And this proportion is fixed and exogenous for simplicity. And they maximize the, the utility function subject to the budget constraint as the borrowers, but they have this extra collateral constraint that just says that uh, debt repayments cannot e exceed a proportion, which is the loan to value, of the value of their houses. And we have here two collateral constraints depending on the type of interest rate they are facing. If they are facing a variable interest rate or a fixed interest rate. And then as in these Jacobiello type models, uh, the collateral constraint is going to hold with equality so that the economy is endogenously divided into borrowers and savers. And how is this, uh, this uh, fixed interest rate going to be determined? So there is a financial intermediary that accepts deposits and extends both fixed and variable rate loans to consumers. So there's going to be an optimality condition for the setting of the fixed interest rate, which implies that at each point in time, the intermediary is indifferent between lending at a variable or at a fixed rate. So in the end, the fixed interest rate is just a weighted discounted average of all future variable rates in the economy. So it, it is like a long term rate, okay, nothing special. And then financial markets are going to clear. Um, the problem of the firms is standard in sticky price models. So we have firms that produce uh, consumption goods. We have sticky prices so that we are going to have a Phillips curve and monetary policy has real effects. And uh, for simplicity, housing supply is going to be fixed. Monetary policy is set uh, through a Taylor rule. So it's uh, standard and it's national. So we have a Taylor rule for the UK and a Taylor rule for the for the EU. I assume that the whole EU is in the in, in the monetary union. Okay, I know that some countries are not, but just for simplicity, I assume that there is just a single central bank, the ECB, and then the interest rate responds to uh, inflation with some smoothing. So once I have set up the model, I can calibrate it. So most of the parameters are calibrated following standard values in the in the literature, but I allow for some heterogeneity in uh, calibration across countries. So this would be the key parameters that differ from country to country. So for example, the average LTV. So I go to the data and I look at the average LTV in the UK, which is 0.72, and the average LTV in the EU, which is 0.78. Then the proportion of variable rates, this is an important parameter because most of the consumers or more than one half of the consumers in the, in the UK uh, borrow at a variable rate. This is, this is an important feature in the, in the UK. But the large countries in the, in the EU, for example, Germany, the majority of consumers would borrow at a fixed rate. And this has uh, consequences, especially for the conduct of monetary policy. And then, of course, the country size. So, so the, the country size, the, the UK size is 0 0.16. So it's small as compared to the rest of the European Union. So this, uh, this heterogeneity in calibration should have some consequences. So for example, the different LTVs. So the financial accelerator should be more powerful, more powerful in the EU than in the UK, given that, that the LTV is higher in the EU. What about the uh, proportion of, more, of variable rate mortgages? So variable rate mortgages in the UK um, as opposed to fixed rate mortgages in the EU. So monetary policy should be more effective in the UK as studies on the topic suggest. 
And then the UK is a relatively small economy as compared to the rest of the EU. So these things should have implications in the model. So for example, we can check that with impulse responses. So if we just shock the, the, the model with a, with a symmetric shock, just the same productivity shock to both countries, we see differences, okay? So these differences in calibration, this heterogeneity in housing markets uh, make a difference in the um, dynamics of the model. So even if the shock is symmetric, this productivity shock impacts more strongly the EU than the UK because of its characteristics. So the effects on financial markets on the real economy are not symmetric. Okay? So here we, I have plotted GDP, inflation, but also uh, financial and housing um, variables, so house prices, the interest rate, uh, mortgage houses, credit, the blue line is the EU and the solid black line is the UK. So we see that not all, only the real economy, but also financial markets get affected differently uh, with the same shock, with the same real shock. So these differences may advocate for macroprudential policies that are set independently according to country specific needs, because we see that country specific needs are different. So before Brexit, the UK is somehow restricted to the supervision of the European Systemic Risk Board. But after Brexit, the UK will have the chance to implement a non-coordinated macroprudential policy. So it may take this chance, given that we see that uh, the characteristics of both economies are different. So, let me talk about macroprudential policy then. So we see from the model that there are differences in the economy, differences in uh, responses in financial market. So let's talk about macroprudential policy. So how is macroprudential policy in the EU set? So some macroprudential measures, including changes in the LTV, are set at a national level in the European Union. However, they are supervised and coordinated by the European Systemic Risk Board and the ECB. So as part of the EU, the UK was under the supervisory umbrella of the European Systemic Risk Board. But after Brexit, this is no longer the case and no official coordination is taking place. So how can I approximate this macroprudential policy setting in the model? So what I do is to consider two regions, um, two regions setting macroprudential policy independently. So in the pre-Brexit scenario, both regions coordinate when implementing their policies in the sense that optimal policies aim at maximizing social welfare. So macroprudential policy is going to be decided, the optimal macroprudential policy is going to be decided simultaneously by the two regions. Uh, maximizing the total welfare. But after Brexit, each region maximizes their own welfare. So each region independently taking as given the, uh, the other region's uh, optimal policy is going to maximize its own welfare. And then the result will be the Nash, the Nash equilibrium. And then I compare the two scenarios in terms of optimality of policies, welfare and macroeconomic and financial stability. So these are the rules, the macroprudential policy rules that I am considering. So they are tailored type rules for the LTV, for the loan to value. And its country has its own rule, which responds to this B is credit borrowing. So responds to credit developments in the economy and to uh, output macroeconomic developments in the economy. So that if there is a credit boom or a macroeconomic boom, uh, the LTV is cut, okay? And I um, allow for um, the, the macroeconomic changes to affect the LTV because recent research has shown that uh, sometimes macroprudential policy can complement monetary policy and uh, also respond to macroeconomic activity. So for welfare, I use a second order approximation of the future stream of utility of each agent, and I aggregate across agents and across countries, and I present results in consumption equivalence. 
So uh, how much of, uh, so what proportion or what percentage of your consumption you would be willing to sacrifice in order to be in a better situation. Okay, just some intuition. So the majority of borrowers in the UK, they mortgage at a variable interest rate, but borrowers in the EU do that at a fixed rate. So macroprudential policy responding to macroeconomic changes may compensate the lack of effectiveness of monetary policy. And also the LTV ratio dictates the strength of the financial accelerator. And recent studies have uh, shown that a stronger financial accelerator may make it optimal for macro proof to respond to output. So the intuition tells us that optimal macro proof in the EU should be more aggressive than in the UK and respond to output. So this is what I find. This is the optimal macro prudential policy in the UK and in the EU pre-Brexit and after Brexit. So these are the parameters in the macroprudential rule, the one for credit and the one for output. So we actually see that uh, macroprudential policy in the EU, uh, both pre-Brexit and Brexit is more aggressive than uh, in the UK. And it responds more strongly to output than to credit. Pre-Brexit, also the UK, responds to credit, sorry, to output. But after Brexit, when it's able to set its own macroprudential policy with no supervision, it finds it optimal to respond just to credit and not to output. So post Brexit for the UK, the Timbergen principle applies. So separation of objectives in policy. So monetary policy would be devoted to macroeconomic stability, and uh, macroprudential policy would be devoted to credit stability, to financial stability. And uh, something to, to also show, um, macroprudential policy in the EU does not really change after Brexit, okay? So the UK represents a small weight in the whole EU. So the EU is not going to change its policy after Brexit. And these are the volatilities. So this shows how financial and macroeconomic stability are changing pre-Brexit and post-Brexit. So we see that, uh, so this is the, the standard deviation of credit, which is a proxy for financial stability. So we see that the UK with this Timbergen principle that applies separation of objectives manages to get more financial stability. So it's really optimal for that for them to follow its own policy and not to be supervised. And um, macro, um, macroeconomic stability is not really um, affected. And this is the welfare gain. So for the UK, there is a welfare gain after Brexit. And for the EU, there is a small welfare loss, but actually the welfare gain of the UK uh, compensates the welfare loss of the, of the EU. Okay, so let me just conclude. So what I do in this paper is to use a two country DSD model to address the following research question. So how do optimal macroprudential policy uh, and financial stability change after Brexit, both for the UK and the EU? So macroprudential policy is proxied by a rule on the LTV that responds uh, to both credit and macroeconomic developments. So I focus on the two scenarios, pre-Brexit and, and, and Brexit, and I find that it is optimal for the UK to have a less aggressive macroprudential policy than the EU. And after Brexit, the UK is better off by setting its own macroprudential policy, because when taking into account only its own uh, welfare, the UK uh, finds it optimal to uh, have to apply the Tinbergel principle, so separation of objectives, just respond to credit developments, mainly to, due to the fact that the UK has a majority of borrowers that borrow at a variable rate and the LTV is lower than in the EU. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone and thank you for keeping us on time. Uh, so we have just under 10 minutes left before uh, we get cut off. So if people have questions, I uh, feel free to ask them now. Yeah, uh, I can ask a question. This is Shokti Nil Roy. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, okay, so I have a question. So basically, all these papers are very interesting, and uh, I'm not on video, sorry, but you know, just uh, uh, so these papers are very interesting, and uh, the and one of the papers actually captured both the effects of uh, credit uh, bubble, uh, credit boom, and asset bubbles, and the last paper is on Brexit. My question is, how do we, uh, you know, it, it, we also find that capital inflows are very important. In, in terms of uh, you know generating asset bubbles and credit bubbles, so how you know this is a question to all all the presenters like, and how to incorporate the effects of capital inflows. So when when it comes to macroprudential policies, you know we have to look at the uh, capital inflows also. So that is an aspect I think if I'm if I'm you know if I'm have not missed anything, maybe this has not been part of the analysis presented here. So just correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, okay. Let me let me try to get this up of the uh, uh, the question. Yeah, yeah you're really right. Capital interests are super super important. Now in the work I presented, it is we have a small open economy, so essentially credit is in the form of capital inflows, but this doesn't mean that we are model or the least premium associated with them, but it has, you know, the flavor of a sudden stop. So, uh, 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 to, to, to go a little bit back to the, to, to the mechanism, uh, the bubble grows with consumption, and essentially consumption, you know, is higher, with higher credit, so it contributes to the accumulation of the bubble. So to, to that extent, it is, yeah, I, I agree with you. Capital flows are very important. They should be modeled, uh, you know, you can model them in much more detail to capture risk premium. We don't do that, but I totally, you know, agree with your, your intervention. Thank you. Maybe also to add that, um, so my, my model, doesn't, doesn't speak to this question in particular, but I think the Bank of England has produced some staff working papers that look into that question of microprudential policy from a more international perspective. Um, so it's probably worthwhile just like looking at some of the staff working papers that were published um, a while ago. Thank you. We have a little more than five minutes left if anyone else wants to, to jump in with a question. If, if I may ask a question um, um, for Alex. <laughs> um, uh, so Alex, I, I found this really interesting um, how you set up uh, your model. And so of course you look at like equity prices in the stock market. Um, but what it reminded me of a little bit is like this kind of like how some countries deal with that question in the housing market. So especially something called like the mortgage lending value, um, where you don't take into like effect like the market price of the property, but actually take into kind of account like a kind of a long term sustainable value of like the property price and you base on that how much uh, credit actually you can get. Um, so the loan to value is kind of not based on the property price, but on kind of this sustainable lending value that's calculated by professionals and um, in, a, in a boom that's kind of lower and you know in a, in a bust it would be higher. Um, so is there any read across um, of something like that? I, I think I got the impression you kind of find the opposite result from how it's implemented in kind of some countries in the property market, but maybe you know can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, thanks. So uh, I was aware of that, and actually I found it super interesting. So we drop you an email later. This is uh, uh, mechanically uh, to, to to have a, a, a bubble on a productive asset is extremely hard to get it into models, and this is one of the contributions. So the whole literature that started these housing bubbles are essentially on useless assets. So if, in, 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 it is, it, I think it is something that can resolve this issue now. I don't know how it will operate. I have to study a little bit this market, but I found this thing extremely interesting. This thing, what you're saying. So I'll drop you an email later. Uh, I have a question for 
margarita yes uh, yeah so uh, in your model uh, i i uh, i was not clear what are the trade offs associated uh, with the policy uh, in terms of the differences between eu and europe uh, sorry eu and the uk uh, how do uh, you know uh, other than uh, the fixed and variable rates and the ltv what are the you know uh, the fundamental trade offs which uh, which determine uh, the welfare consequences across both the uh, both the economies so you mean uh, the the welfare differences so these are these are the key issues because other than that the two economies are symmetric except for the for the for the size of the economy so, so I, I focus on these uh, this particular uh, uh, differences in calibration. So these are the, these are the main drivers. Okay, and uh, uh, what you what you consider as LTV, uh, like uh, you do not consider uh, capital adequacy ratio separately. So, uh, this, can we uh, can we interpret the same thing? Uh, will it? Uh, will it be applicable for capital adequacy ratios? Uh, so, so in this in these models, the dynamics work very similar. If you if you apply borrower side or supply side measures, so capital requirement ratios or LTVs. The only thing is that if I wanted to match it with reality, um, the 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 policy. So, so the capital requirement ratio policy is not going to change after Brexit because this is more related to Basel III, so the Basel Committee requirement. So it's internationally set. So Brexit is not going to affect that. But uh, the setting of LTVs, for example, is going to be subject to a different uh, framework. So that's why I just focus on, on LTVs because of the, of the specific research question that I'm addressing, which is consequences after Brexit. So I, we expect no consequences on capital requirement ratio settings after Brexit. So that's why I don't include it in the model. Thanks. Uh, and uh, Alex, I have a question uh, uh, regarding uh, regarding your model. Uh, so, in one of one of the features of the Mendonca uh, Mendonca Bianchi model is that it it, gen it does not generate a very high level of overborrowing, right? So, uh, in both the planner's solution and uh, the competitive equilibrium, the difference in terms of overborrowing is not much. So, I, I guess your model will be able to. To generate uh, uh, a substantial difference between the two, if 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 I'm if I'm not wrong. In, 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 yes, yes. So um, uh, actually, we do find the bigger uh, thing, and uh, this is captured. Uh, I didn't show you these results, but this is captured in the tax in the optimal tax uh, figure. As you can see, the the optimal tax was actually double the size of the tax in Bianchi Mendoza. Now, reversing this thing, the overborrowing essentially was much higher in order to have a much higher tax. And the idea is very simply, very simply. The BAPI today allows you to continue accumulating more debt without being constrained. So it allows you to accumulate more and more debt because it, it, the collateral constraints do not bound today with the BAPI. Whereas in the Bianchi Mendoza world, you can accumulate debt, but there is a point that you will exceed your borrowing capacity. The bubble actually expands it. Okay. And that's the way it allows you to, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks. May I ask a question, please? 